Oh, hey everybody. Um, have you ever heard of the term tip of the iceberg? Well, I hadn't before I uh, made my way out here to the iceberg to see what it all meant. And um, well, a lot of doors have been opened to me. You're probably wondering why I'm here at this iceberg and why we're so far north and what it has to do with Disneyland. I wish, sure wish I was in Orlando right now. Today we are talking about the Disneyland iceberg. Not actually this iceberg behind me, this is just a normal iceberg, which begs the question, why did I come out here in the first place? The Disneyland iceberg is more of a virtual iceberg. This is a real one. It cost me a lot of money to get out here, and I think I'm beginning to suffer frostbite. Oh uh, yeah, that's necrotic. All right, we're gonna need to go to the voiceover before this starts to spread through the rest of my body. Let's talk about the Disneyland iceberg. Now an iceberg isn't just a piece of freshwater ice more than 15 meters long that has broken off a glacier or an ice shelf and is floating freely in the open salt water, thanks Wikipedia. It's also a way you can measure one's knowledge or expertise on a subject, in this case, Disneyland. Like I mentioned when I was freezing to death earlier, the tip of the iceberg is a saying that represents, oh, this is just basic knowledge that most everyone knows about a certain subject, but you can go deeper down the rabbit hole. And if there's anything I know you guys like, and I know I like, it's going deep down Disneyland rabbit holes, not that one. You know, I'm gonna keep the voice crack in there because this video is going to get insane, believe me. Here's a picture of the iceberg chart we are going to be looking at today. Here at the top, you can see some general well-known trivia facts about Disneyland, but the farther down we go, the scarier, more mysterious, and more niche the topics become. For this video, we will be consulting the highest rated iceberg chart I can find, which was uploaded to the iceberg charts subreddit by figmentfan1982. I am also a figment fan, so, you know, birds of a feather. And I am going to guide you all through each and every single one of these topics. Some may be a little bit more obscure, but I'm gonna try my best to relay them to all of you, my friends. We'll start off with, yes, the the tip of the iceberg. Here at the top layer, with Happy New Mickey, we have Disneyland cats. Now back around the construction of Disneyland, Anaheim had a lot of feral cats, and some found their way into the park. Now back before California Adventure existed, they made their home inside of Sleeping Beauty Castle, actually. And you could still find them wandering around the park today. Disney keeps them around as sort of a natural form of pest control. They help kill all the, um, non-speaking mice. But you can also find them over at California Adventure, mainly over in the Redwood Creek Challenge Trail area, sort of grizzly airfield kind of place. The cat you're most likely to encounter over here is actually named Francisco, and I've seen him before, and he's lovely. Now, if you happen to cross paths with one of these feral cats, I personally wouldn't try to pet one. I mean, they're not going to attack you or anything. They're pretty chill most of the time. I'd say just keep your distance, admire from afar, and uh, let them do their jobs. They're employees, they're cast members, they help make the magic. Ashes in the Haunted Mansion. Now, if you're a true offhand Disney and Disney Dan super fan, you watch the Foolish Mortals podcast and you know everything about Ashes in the Haunted Mansion. But to make a long story short, because the Haunted Mansion is a ride having to do with death and it's a very popular Disney ride, Disney fans in their life sometimes want their ashes to be scattered in the Haunted Mansion. There's been cases of this happening in the past, but for the most part, at the end of the day, the third shift workers, the people who clean up the mansion, come in and end up vacuuming it all up and throwing it away. So if you want to spend forever in the mansion, just go on it as much as you can. Can. Don't burn yourself up and then toss yourself in the ballroom scene. Believe me, I've tried. It's sort of become an urban legend over the years that people often scatter the remains of their dead relatives in the mansion. Hopefully it doesn't happen too often, and hopefully that dust you see on top of the photos and shelves of the mansion is just that dust. Because I don't want to be breathing in Grandpa, even if he was the biggest Haunted Mansion fan ever. Which is impossible because that's me. Walt's frozen head. Now, aside from being a very entertaining Twitter account, there is an urban legend, these are lots, lots of urban legends here, that Walt Disney was cryogenically frozen and his body was placed under the Pirates of the Caribbean attraction in New Orleans Square. Cryogenics being essentially freezing the human body at the point of near death or death in hopes that they'd be able to be revived one day. And in some versions of this urban legend, it is not Walt's entire body that's frozen under Pirates of the Caribbean, but instead just his head. So I guess when they bring him back, he'll be some sort of super cool android walking around the park, sort of like Paul Rudd in that episode of What If? Although this legend long ago was debunked, because, I mean, there's not much underneath Pirates of the Caribbean besides some water pumps and maybe one or two storage areas and tracks. 
But hey, no, I get it. It's not as cool as your founder's frozen body part being locked away for future generations to revive underneath one of your most famous attractions. But if you do have an interest in human heads and Pirates of the Caribbean, don't you worry. We're gonna be getting to that a little lower down into the iceberg. Forced perspective. Now, I'm sure a lot of you watching this channel know what forced perspective is, but for those of you who don't, the features on Sleeping Beauty Castle and Main Street USA get smaller as they get higher, giving the illusion of height. This isn't always done vertically, even though that's the most famous example, sometimes it's done horizontally, where the buildings get shorter the further you go down Main Street to make it look longer than it really is. And when it comes to the Disney parks, there are so many examples of forced perspective that I probably can't cover them in this video, although I should make a video on the best uses of forced perspective in the parks. In Pandora and Galaxy's Edge, the plants get higher the further you go up the rock work, same with the Matterhorn. The Beast's Castle at Be Our Guest in the Magic Kingdom tries and fails miserably to look very far away, but very large. It just looks like a small castle. A cool example of smaller forced perspectives is the Alps in the background of the Pinocchio Village scene in Storybook Land Canal Boats actually blend in with the Matterhorn, so the Matterhorn sort of becomes part of the mountain range. That's just a Disneyland insider tip for those of you watching this video. George. Now, this is a very famous ghost story from Walt Disney World's Pirates of the Caribbean. The legend has it that during the construction of the attraction, a construction worker named George was working on the tower just to the left of the Spanish Fort as soon as you come out of the caves, and while he was working on it, he tragically fell to his death. Some say his spirit still haunts the attraction to this very day, and if you don't say good morning and good night, George, as you open and close the ride respectively, the ride will break down and mysterious things will begin to happen. Now me, personally, I'm a non-believer in George because there is no record of anyone ever dying during the construction of Pirates of the Caribbean. Because remember, the park was open at that time. Pirates was not an opening day ride at the Magic Kingdom. But I've met people who swear up and down that George is real and have even caught photos of him. Honestly though, I'm just gonna leave this one up to you all. Do you have any George ghost stories? I would love to hear them. Leave them you know, down in the comments. And uh, <clears throat> Before we move on, good, good night, George. The Utilidors, I mean, the Utilidors, are underneath the Magic Kingdom in Walt Disney World. It's okay, Figment Fan 1982. I've done more embarrassing typos in my videos before. Don't, don't, don't fret. The urban legend of there being a hidden city underneath Walt Disney World is sort of true. There are tunnels underneath the Magic Kingdom for cast members to get from point A to point B without spoiling the magic. The famous example being Walt Disney saw a Frontierland cowboy walking through Tomorrowland. Or is it a Tomorrowland astronaut walking through Frontierland? It varies. So during the construction of Disneyland, instead of having a backstage, they sort of have an understage. Except because of the water level in Orlando, the Utilidors are actually on ground level and the Magic Kingdom is on the second floor, so to say. They used to offer tours of the Utilidors, N not really anymore, obviously, but you they are real and cast members do use them. Epcot kind of has little ones and so does Tomorrowland at Disneyland, not really on the same scale as the Magic Kingdom, but it has some tunnels. Mostly used for maintenance and storage though. You know, like Walt's head. River Country, the abandoned water park that used to sit by Fort Wilderness. It was attached partly to Bay Lake, so you would be swimming in the lake water, and the brain-eating amoeba, as we all know, kind of wreaked some havoc around there, so they had to shut it down. You know that, and the tourism decline after September 11th. The weird thing, though, is that Disney just left it abandoned there for the better part of two decades before finally ripping it up and using the site to build Reflections, a lakeside lodge or that's what they were going to do before COVID hit and plans were seemingly scrapped. Although they ended up starting construction on Reflections before COVID, so there is some work being done over there. Nobody really knows what's going to end up happening though. Either way, when you think of abandoned things at Disney, River Country is usually the first thing that comes to people's minds. You know, that and the, uh, the Muppet Vision Theater. Uh, but that, that doesn't count. I love the Muppets, so they're, they're safe. Cinderella Castle Suite. This one is kind of self-explanatory. There is a hotel suite inside of Cinderella Castle, originally made for executives and famous people visiting Walt Disney World, nowadays mostly just reserved for the famous people. During the Year of a Million Dreams celebration, though, random guests would be selected to spend a night in the castle, just as a little treat for them. And yeah, that's a bit of a treat. The, the suite is amazing. It's probably been updated since this footage, but yeah, it's my dream to spend a night in Cinderella Castle. Someone make some calls. Someone make it happen. And call yellow shoes 
30 Steps from a Garbage Can. Now this is another popular tale about Walt Disney attending a carnival, or even just Disneyland in general, depends on the storyteller, and watching to see how long it took for a guest to discard their trash onto the ground. He didn't measure it in time though, he measured it in steps, and the average amount of steps a guest would take before discarding their trash onto the ground was 30. And so that's why at Disneyland today, if you look around, you will see a trash can roughly every 30 feet. It's all to help keep the park as clean as we possibly can. We have to all do our part. If you see an empty water bottle on a trellis in the Haunted Mansion queue, pick it up, throw it away. Walt would be very proud. Walt's candle. Now it says candle, but I'm assuming this one is referring to Walt's lamp above the fire station at Disneyland. You see, back when Disneyland first opened, Walt had a small apartment above the fire station on Main Street. I guess he still technically does? It's still there? And every time the boss was in the park, the lamp in the window facing Main Street was illuminated, letting cast members know to be on their best behavior, and letting guests know to watch out for Walt if you want some autographs. Walt sadly passed away in 1966, though, and that meant that he wouldn't be visiting the park anytime soon, and so the light was turned off. Although over the years, some people cleaning the apartment would notice that the light would turn on by itself. Maybe someone earlier had turned it on, maybe it was the spirit of Walt Disney himself, I'm sure we'll never know, but it started started the tradition of the Disneyland staff keeping the light on at all times as sort of a memory or a way of saying that Walt Disney is still in the park, that his spirit lives on through Disneyland, and I think that's really beautiful. So whenever you pass the fire station, look up at the lamp and know that Walt Disney is still in the park. Or at least his head is. Club 33, the very exclusive club above New Orleans Square that only the ultra-rich can attend, or the people who Disney chooses to attend. I've been before, and the food was amazing, the atmosphere was unmatched, and the staff, well, they were some of the nicest people I had ever met. If you hang back by the mint julep bar, sort of by where the bathrooms are, and look over to your right toward the Court of Angels, you will see the door marked with a 33. That's the entrance. If you wait and watch, maybe sometimes you'll see a famous person or just a rich person walk out. You can ask them how their meal was, because it, odds are it was amazing, because the food there is fantastic. Have I mentioned I've, uh, I've been to Club 33? I mean, it's whatever. No, I mean, no one's counting, but I've, uh... <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, I've been. Nothing weird, scary, or obscene happens up there like some urban legends say. It's just a restaurant and lounge. But it's a very exclusive restaurant and lounge, which means that there has to be some conspiracy theories popping up about it. And last but not least for the top layer, we have Andy's Coming! Which was, back in the olden days, before people had to ruin things, a thing you could shout at the Toy Story characters to make them flop onto the floor and pretend to be toys. Since this began picking up traction, though, if you were to run up to a Toy Story character and yell Andy's coming today, they may look around shocked, but they won't flop to the floor because people ruined it because it became too mainstream. But it was a fun little thing that happened sometimes. I mean, I'm not saying before a certain period of time, if you ran up to a Toy Story character and yelled this, they would always flop it just depended on how they were feeling when you caught them. But I mean, according to this picture, yeah, it was a thing. Not anymore though. Moving on down to the slightly creepier Mickey Mouse of my childhood, we have the Main Street windows. The windows on Main Street as you enter both Disneyland and Walt Disney World and every Disneyland style park across the world all bear the names of people who helped build and create those parks, sometimes manage them. You'll find a window for Rolly Crump or Bob Gurr, people who helped with these parks, and also newer windows like those belonging to Tony Baxter or the newest one belonging to George Caligridis. They serve as sort of, depending on which way you're walking down Main Street, opening or closing credits to what you're about to experience, and I think that's really cool. Half light bulb. If you're at Disneyland and you go down to the Coke corner at the end of Main Street and look up toward the door in the corner, you will see that right above the door there is a light bulb painted both red and white. That's because everything has to be perfectly symmetrical. Another <sighs> legend is that Walt was one day walking down Main Street and noticed two white or two red light bulbs next to each other in the spot and that simply wouldn't do. So he had Imagineers paint half of the light bulb the opposite color so that way when they met in the middle, everything would be symmetrical. And it just serves as one of these quirky things that Disneyland has and the extents Disney will go to make sure the attention to detail in their park is better than anyone else's. I uh, don't see Legoland with any half-painted light bulbs. Weird. Monorail deaths. Okay, now we're getting into the, some more of the gruesome aspects. I can dig it. This refers to the deaths that have happened on the Walt Disney World and Disneyland monorail. Like on June 8th of 1966, Thomas Cleveland from Northridge, California was killed while attempting to sneak into the park by climbing onto the monorail track. Obviously he got hit by a monorail and 
Yeah, it's very sad that someone had to lose their life, but like also don't do that. The second one though is way more sad in 2009 during a failed track switchover from the Epcot line onto the Magic Kingdom Express line, Monorail Pink backed to Monorail Purple at the TTC, killing Monorail Purple's 21 year old pilot. Uh, that's just, that's just a horrible tragedy. Mr. One Way. Hey, I, I actually recently talked about this one. Mr. One Way is the ghost of a man who will ride alongside single riders at Disneyland Space Mountain. Allegedly, he has red hair and will disappear by the time you get off the attraction. Where was that person sitting next to you? I'm sure the ride operators don't know. Hopefully he didn't fall out back there in the big dark show building and the video that you see playing right now is the only recorded evidence we have of Mr. One Way. Unless, again, you all have more that I haven't seen. Please, please let me know. He's called Mr. One Way obviously because he never gets off the ride. He only gets on and disappears halfway through. America sings death. Now this... <sighs> You're trying to get me all, all sad here today. This is another horrible tragedy that happened at America Sings, formerly known as Innoventions, formerly known as Star Wars Launch Bay, now known as the empty building at the back of Tomorrowland at Disneyland. The building was home to the Carousel of Progress, after it was retired from the World's Fair, but when the carousel was brought over to Walt Disney World so more people could see it, America Sings replaced it. In 1974, an 18-year-old cast member named Deborah Stone was accidentally crushed to death between two walls of the building between 10.35 p.m. and 10.40 p.m. Not, not a very magical story, but it, it happened, so it's important to acknowledge this. And those same animatronics are actually in Splash Mountain to this day. Just fun fact. The Haunted Mansion security footage. Hey, I talked about this in the same video that I talked about Mr. One Way in. If you look here, you can see security footage of the outside of the Haunted Mansion leading toward the Rivers of America. If you look closely, you can sort of see the silhouette of a man walking out of the mansion. Is this a ghost escaping, bringing the number down to 998 Happy Haunts? Or because this is still in the day of videotape, is this a double exposure of a maintenance worker or perhaps park guest leaving the mansion? Could be either one of them, but uh, probably the, the second one. I'm not ruling out the first one though, which leads us to this one. The Haunted Mansion is actually haunted. Now there are tons of ghost stories for the Haunted Mansion. The Crying Boy, the Man with the Cane. All of them can be found on DoomBuggies.com, but there are multiple reports from cast members and guests alike over the years of some unexplained phenomena going on inside the mansion. Is it just a trick of the light? Your senses playing tricks with you? Or are there actually spirits haunting the halls? bringing the number up to probably 1,002 or 3, breaking the whole, you know, 999 haunts thing. All I know is it can get quite unnerving in there in the late hours of the night when you're essentially by yourself in the mansion. I also highly recommend going in there by yourself at the late hours of the night. Helps build that immersion. Pirates of the Caribbean, Real Bones. Now, this is what I was talking about. Allegedly, back when Pirates of the Caribbean opened in 1967, all of the skeletons in the cave scene were made using real human skeletons obtained from the local college. Now, obviously, these bones are too pearly white. If you look at them up close, they look too perfect. And that's because if they were at one point real bones, they have since been switched out for fake skeletons. But one remnant of the real human bones that used to allegedly be in Pirates of the Caribbean sit on the headboard above the magnificent glass pirate and the cave scene. Now if you look at this skull compared to all the others, it's slightly bigger and a bit more discolored, less bleached than the other ones. Is this a real human skull? I choose to believe that it is. Especially if you look at close-up pictures of this, the other skulls don't look like that. It's got imperfections, and if it's an old skull, obviously it's gonna have some flaws. I'm just curious whose skull it is. Who donated their body to science all those years ago, hoping to be used for the advancement of science and humanity as a whole, only to be used as a prop instead in a Disneyland attraction? Pretty funny. Platform Delta. Now, for a little background, in the Tower of Terror at Hollywood Studios, there are four loading platforms, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta, which load into two drop shafts named Echo and Foxtrot. Easy. As the story goes, many years ago, a bellhop was working platform Delta and loading guests onto the attraction. Suddenly though, for some weird unknown reason, he dropped dead right there on the spot as guests were loading into Delta. At the end of each night, the bellhop working each platform has to ride through and make sure the attraction is running as it should. Yes, that means the cast member running platform Delta has to as well. Cast members have said that they will do platforms Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie before moving on to platform Delta 
Delta all together. They ride it all together. And this is all because the ghost of the cast member who died that night at Platform D still haunts that shaft to this day. The attraction would shut down or freeze and the lights would go on and off at weird times. And the ghosts on the attraction wouldn't be on their queue when they were set to appear on certain floors. Now, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time on this one, but you may be noticing some similarities between this and the George story from the Magic Kingdom. And yeah, I think this is just Hollywood Studios' own version of George. Moving on, Walt is alive. Now, this one is a bit confusing to me. Walt Disney is dead and cremated, he's at Forest Lawn Cemetery. Or it could be a conspiracy theory that he somehow faked his own death and either is surviving to this very day, even though he would be over a hundred years old, or that, you know, it ties back to Walt's frozen head theory being underneath Pirates of the Caribbean that he could come back any day now. It's all just a theory that Walt Disney never died in the first place. It was all just a stunt. And now we go down to creepier opening day Mickey Mouse. Snow White dies. Now this theory can relate to either the movie or the theme park attraction. It's sort of the same story in both. But it all stems from the fact that after Snow White takes a bite of the poison apple, she dies, at least in the story, until the handsome prince comes, gives her true love's kiss, and brings her back to life, eventually leading her away into his glowing kingdom, surrounded by clouds, which, if you look at it, kind of sounds and looks like heaven. I think this is just people misinterpreting how the prince's kingdom and Snow White's happily ever after is somewhat a kind of paradise. Kind of like the Christian heaven. And the same stands for the new Snow White's Enchanted Wish as well. It's the same kind of ending with the storybook there at the end. So, I mean, choose to believe what you want, but I think she's alive. Escape from tomorrow. Now, I was gonna do a video solely on this topic a long time ago. I still haven't gotten around to it, but if you guys are interested, please let me know. Escape from Tomorrow is an independent thriller film directed by Randy Moore that was actually filmed inside Walt Disney World without the permission of Disney. And depending on who you ask, it's either a work of genius comparable to movies by David Lynch or a really, really bad garbled mess of a movie. I am in the second camp. I think it's terrible. Like, truly awful. Maybe I'll do a watch along, but the, the movie is very bad. People were waiting for Disney's response on the movie to see if they would sue or if they would ban actors and directors from the parks for life, but Disney didn't do anything and they didn't comment on it. So that hope for free publicity provided by Disney kind of fell flat. I don't know. Watch it on your own. Form your own opinions. I think it's not very good. Like, very worse than not good. It's bad. It's very bad. Discovery Island. Now, we've made a couple videos on this in the past. It's an abandoned island that sort of served as a precursor to Animal Kingdom before Animal Kingdom was ever open. It was sort of a wildlife sanctuary that was closed and essentially just abandoned by Disney. They left everything except for the animals there, and it's still there to this day, just rotting away, exposed to the elements there on Bay Lake. You can drive past it in a boat if you want to. I've done it before. On off starboard, starboard side here, you can see Discovery Island. <laughs> Big Red. Now this actually relates to the real Animal Kingdom, specifically to Kilimanjaro Safari and a dropped storyline that existed in the early days of the attraction. Originally, the story was that poachers had caught a mother elephant and her child, Big Red and Little Red, and it was our job to hunt down the poachers and save the elephants. Unfortunately, we could only get to one of them in time. Big Red, the mother, was slaughtered horribly by the poachers, and yes, you did drive by a desiccated corpse of a mother elephant. Pretty dark stuff. This was all just for cast member previews. By the actual grand opening of the ride, the bloody elephant was removed and Little Red was saved at the end until they removed Little Red also. Now, if you ride Kilimanjaro Safaris, there is no story, but you can still see references to Big and Little Red in the queue if you keep an eye out. Hell. Now, I am assuming this is a reference to when you get hit by a train and sent to the netherworld in Mr. Toad's Wild Ride at Disneyland. Yes, it's hot. There are little tiny rubber devils and a dragon there at the end before you get sent back to Toad Hall. It's very dark, but also very silly. And something that I think sets Mr. Toad's Wild Ride apart from all of the other Fantasyland rides and makes it the best out of all of them. Although I'm not sure why this is three tiers down. I mean, it's sort of a self-explanatory part of the ride, but hey, I guess it is a bit dark, so I put, it, put it down there. This next one is also really dark. Javier Cruz was a cast member who was killed in 2004 in an accident behind the scenes in Walt Disney World. The police had ruled it a horrible, horrible accident after a float had ran over the man. Urban Explorers Blackmail. Now this just goes about the way Disney has decided to punish some of the urban explorers who break into behind the scenes areas at the Disney parks. Now this isn't something I feel completely qualified to talk about because I would never go about doing these things myself and it's also a legal issue, probably still ongoing. Essentially it's just a big old tangled up legal mess that I have no authority to comment on 
at all. But if you're interested in learning more, there are plenty of channels covering this. Just go ahead and search it up. You'll, you'll find something. Haunted Mansion Window Ghost. Now this, oh, oh, I know about this one. I can comment on this one. This is an old effect that used to happen at the Disneyland Mansion and still happens at the Walt Disney World Mansion. If you visit the Haunted Mansion at night and look through the windows in the front of the house, you may notice a ghostly orb floating through the halls. Now, unless they fixed it with the recent renovation of the Haunted Mansion at Disneyland, this does not exist, but at Disney World, you can still see it from time to time. It's a pretty cool effect that adds just a little bit of extra atmosphere while you wait in line. No one can die at Disney. Now, this is a very commonly retold myth. Myth as in not true. People say when someone is killed or gravely injured at the Disney parks, they are first moved off property in order to be pronounced dead so that no one can ever technically die at the Disney parks. Now you can die at Disneyland or Disney World, it's happened before, but in order to be pronounced legally dead, it has to be done by a doctor or EMT or someone who is qualified. And usually those qualified people are at the hospitals, which are, yes, off property. But that's not to say no one has ever been pronounced dead on property, it has happened on multiple occasions. So the next time someone tells you that nobody dies at Disney, you have to tell them that that is both legally and factually incorrect. It does happen, it's just rare. Moving on down to, ugh, emu meat. Now, I don't know why this one caught on the way that it did, but this came from a late night interview with Zachary Levi, where he talked about how big the turkey legs are at the Disney parks and how it could be emu meat. It was just a joke and people really took it and ran with it. Why? I don't know, maybe it's just because he's so darn charming. Maybe it's because it's actually made out of emu meat. No, it's, it's turkey. Yet another myth, although this one is on the newer side, so it's interesting seeing it pop up in new places. Jungle Cruise Frogs. Now this is an abandoned effect, sort of like the ghostly orb in the Haunted Mansion we talked about one tier up. So there used to be frog animatronics at the Magic Kingdom's Jungle Cruise, but they have since been removed because they looked, quote, too silly, even though there are a lot of animals in that attraction, and a lot of them look silly, if you ask me, personally. Bring back the frogs, Disney, what are you doing? The Matterhorn Christmas Tree. Now this was in the early days of Disneyland, before Halloween and Christmas parties, but they did sort of decorate. During the holiday season, back when the Matterhorn was new, they would put a giant twinkling star on top of it to make it sort of look like a Christmas tree. I mean, it kind of does. So if you think about it, this was kind of the first Disney attraction with a holiday overlay. It's Matterhorn Holiday, except there weren't any changes on the inside, it was just the star on the outside. Bring back the Matterhorn Christmas Tree. Come on, Disney, what are you doing? UFO. Now, I know what UFO stands for, and I'm sure you do too, and there are lots of stories revolving around these mysterious flying objects. Wait, that's MFO. Unidentified flying objects. Now, this could be referring to the SpaceX flight that happened over Tomorrowland. You can see a picture of it here. It's really cool. Or just general UFO sightings at Disneyland or Walt Disney World. Or maybe they're referring to the Horizon spaceship that's in the Backlot Express at Hollywood Studios. Eh? That's, that's a few tiers deep, if you ask me. Westcott. The famous cancelled second park for the Disneyland Resort modeled after Epcot at Walt Disney World that was too expensive, never ended up happening, and was replaced eventually by what we have today, Disney California Adventure. <sighs> I mean, hey, you got the space with the Toy Story lot. I mean, just build another parking garage somewhere else and, you know, Westcott. Do Westcott. It's my second favorite Disney park behind Disneyland. Epcot is. They never built Westcott. Moving on. Galaxy's Edge cover-up. Now, I had to do a little research on this one, but this mainly comes down to what I got from this video is an untrue conspiracy about Disney trying to make Galaxy's Edge seem more popular than it actually was, when in reality it was extremely popular. You, you know, you don't need a genius to tell you that. I don't know what people had to gain by lying about how full Galaxy's Edge was when it opened. I guess it's just, you know, the Disney fans love to hate on Disney. But yeah, Disney wasn't paying people to make Galaxy's Edge look like it was completely full and out of merchandise. It actually was just completely full and out of merchandise. Believe me, I was there. This one, uh, this, this is dumb. Land in Texas. Now this has been <laughs> circulating through the Disney rumor mill forever. And I mean forever. The rumor is that Disney has recently bought land in Texas for their third American resort. It pops up every now and then, and people are convinced that it is going to be announced at the next D23, but it never is. 
and I don't think it ever will be. And now that I've gone on record saying that, please look forward to Disney announcing their third resort at the next D23 built in Texas. You're welcome. Slain Knights. Now, this is an entire can of worms to open on its own. The Slain Knights existed at Disney's Animal Kingdom right outside the Dragon's Cave. You see, Beastly Kingdom is an old, canceled, mythological land at Disney's Animal Kingdom that was supposed to center around things like unicorns and dragons and offhand Disney's media pass, you know, mythical creatures. And because it was planned for Phase 2 of Animal Kingdom, they wanted to place a few teasers around the park, which is why you can see a dragon in the logo, and a dragon's head above one of the ticket booths. And when the park first opened along the rivers that surrounded Discovery Island, a dragon's cave that periodically bellowed fire and had the bodies of skewered knights outside, which was, one, very graphic, two, probably frightened a lot of children, and three, friggin' awesome. They have since been removed, but you can still find the dragon's cave to this day although the dragon no longer spits fire from inside. Chewy mode. Now, this one was actually discovered by my friends over at Fresh Baked Disney. Go check it out. But if you press a certain combination of buttons before the ride actually starts, you will unlock Chewy mode, which replaces all of Hondo's narration with Chewy. A little cool Easter egg that the Imagineers threw in there for those super big Star Wars fans, the ones going to discover all the secrets. The Yippies Riot. Now, I did actually didn't know about this, so I had to look it up, and here is my general understanding of the Yippies Riot. Now, the Yippies, or the Youth International Party was a political party founded in 1968 by Jerry Rubin and Abby Hoffman. Now, if you look at your local election ballot, you will notice that the Youth International Party no longer quite makes the cut. But back in the 70s, they were huge. So huge, in fact, that they shut down Disneyland for a day, demanding the liberation of Minnie Mouse, you know, a fictional character, a wage hike for Frontierland's Native American dancers, and the conversion of Aunt Jemima's kitchen into a Black Panthers-themed breakfast joint. The, the group of people, not the Marvel superhero. And yeah, this protest was, uh, it, it, was, it was a big one. Riot police were called out, you can see them here on Main Street, USA. A, a bit of a, a bit of a mess, if you ask me. Luckily, there haven't been any in-park protests nearly this large since. And I just know the way I described that is going to make some people mad, just know that I am dumb, and I see the world through the eyes of a man who idolizes the mummy on the Haunted Mansion, so just keep that in mind. The Tiki Room Fire. Now, this is another sort of myth, sort of confirmed semi-fact that a fire broke out at the Tiki Room Under New Management attraction, burning parts of the show that were exclusive to the Under New Management version, which is what caused the eventual reversion to the original Tiki Room. Well, sort of the original Tiki Room. It's shortened and not as good as Disneyland's, but it is the original Tiki Room. So in the end, all it took was an act of God to bring back our original, much beloved Tiki Room. COVID cover-up. Another another cover-up conspiracy. Okay, let's let's get into this one. Now I think this one is a lot more plausible than the Galaxy's Edge cover-up because you know that actually did not happen. This might have happened. The COVID cover-up is a conspiracy theory that Disney was hiding all of the cases of COVID that came up from its parks, both for cast members and guests. This was in the height of the pandemic, and they wanted people to visit their parks, so they covered up cases to make it seem like they were the safest place on Earth. Even though you're at a public theme park, and even if you're wearing a mask the entire time, accidents happen. So, I mean, come on, there are definitely people being infected with COVID because of the parks. Moving on down to this Mickey, who admittedly is actually kind of precious, the Disney Quest fire. Uh, a fire that happened at Disney Quest. Allegedly, even though there was no structural damage, the firefighters did show up and no one saw the flames or smoke, but th they showed up. Was there a fire? I guess we'll never know. The Boneyard. Aside from being a children's play area at Animal Kingdom and Dino Land, I assume this is talking about the mythical scrapyard Disney sends all of their animatronic parts and abandoned effects. This one is real, and there's lots of locations around the Disney parks where they keep old, either abandoned or unused ride vehicles and animatronics, set pieces, things like that. You're mostly gonna find them in an area known as Central Shop. Good luck getting access to that, though. Maybe... Maybe they have an old people mover vehicle in there. Hmm. The Alien Encounter documentary. Now this is real. It was called Alien Encounters from New Tomorrowland and it released in 1995 and starred, of course, Michael Eisner as himself. It was promotion for the upcoming extraterrestrial alien encounter ride, which is infamous now. The host, Robert Urich, would detail a history of UFO sightings and then tie that into the new Tomorrowland coming to Disney World. You can watch the entire thing on YouTube, it's available. Just type in alien encounter from new Tomorrowland and it'll pop up if you're interested. Both a cool piece of the Eisner era and a leftover remnant of the alien encounter ride. Secret Caves into Disneyland. Now, as far as I can tell, this myth came from a YouTuber known as David August, who filmed himself entering a secret cave to Disneyland and re-emerging on Tom Sawyer Island, and 
you know anything about Disneyland, he filmed himself going in one side of the caves on Tom Sawyer Island and coming out the other side. Although I suppose I helped keep this rumor going because I did have a video where I went into a cave, or a drainage pipe rather, and came out on Main Street USA, so but both of us are equally at fault here, David. Secret tunnels that run into Disneyland, though, that that is a myth. Secret tunnels in Disneyland, well that's a different story. Madame Leota, real seance. Now again, I'm just gonna go out on a ledge here. I don't think that this is uh, very widely known information. If it is, I do not know what it means, but Either A, there's unused Madame Leota dialogue out there somewhere that was used previously to the one that we have today, or B, that she's actually summoning real spirits through the seance lines in the attraction, which is obviously not true. Unless it is, which would explain the Haunted Mansion really being haunted thing all the way up in Tier 2. Alright, and B, B is accurate. B is the one. Proposition 65. California's Proposition 65, also known as the Safe Drinking Water and Toxic Enforcement Act, became law in 1986 and is intended to, quote, help Californians make informed decisions about protecting themselves from chemicals that could cause cancer, birth defects, or other reproductive harm. And if those words I'm saying sort of ring a bell to you, you've probably been to Disneyland before and been to any of their restaurants. These are very common at all of the walk-up restaurants around the Disney Resort, and no, drinking a mint julep will not give you cancer or cause birth defects. For example, coffee contains acrylamide, which in high enough doses has been known to cause cancer in animals, but odds are if you were to drink 18 gallons of coffee, you wouldn't get cancer, you would just be able to see sounds. But when it comes to California's Proposition 65, I suppose no one could ever be too careful. Tower of Terror, Body Under the Stairs. Now, I thought I was insane when I was a child when I found this, but turns out other people noticed this too. Now this was at California's Tower of Terror, and after you got off the ride and looked under the staircase that's still there today, just no more body, you could see a pair of legs sticking out from behind a bag. A little macabre joke put there by the Imagineers, one that will be sorely missed. Cartoon Man. Now this doesn't actually have anything to do with the Disney parks, this is actually a Disney creepypasta written by Freaky Attractions. If you want to find out more, head over to the Freaky Attractions YouTube channel. They have a ton of creepypastas based around Disney and the Disney parks. That's what this one is. Cartoon Man is just a story. Unused Muppet Vision Pre-Show. A mythical, unused version of the Muppet Vision 3D pre-show that I'm not sure ever existed. You can find the entire pre-show online. Maybe this is referring to the Muppets Great Movie Ride attraction, which probably would feature a pre-show, but was eventually cancelled due to the death of Jim Henson. And unless there is an unused Muppet Vision pre-show out there circulating, I... I Nothing in my books or any web research has shown any proof of that existing. Maybe there is. Maybe. Maybe there is, though. Muppet fans, Disney Dans, let me know in the comments down below. Is there an unused Muppet pre-show? That is a spell. I just, I think that, I think, I think I just uttered an incantation of some sort. Haunted Mansion 1966 version. Now, the Haunted Mansion opened in 1969. Earlier in its life cycle, though, it was planned on being a walkthrough exhibit, sort of like how the stretching room and changing portrait hallway are today at California. After the introduction of the Omnimover ride system, though, it was decided to go with that instead because it would be easier to move guests through the different scenes. Because if it was a walkthrough, everyone would want to linger. I know I would, and that would not be good for throughput. Mr. Toad's Wild Ride Last Night. Now, it used to be at both Disneyland and Walt Disney World, but unfortunately, Mr. Toad's Wild Ride no longer exists at the Magic Kingdom. And back before the days of everybody getting mad at Disney on Twitter, everyone had to get mad at Disney in person, and so there were protests outside of the Magic Kingdom and outside the parks that day. Save Mr. Toad was a really, really big movement that, uh, never ended up working, and they replaced it with the mini adventures of Winnie the Pooh nonetheless, although we can still see remnants of him inside the ride and outside the Haunted Mansion. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea leak. Is this referring to the upcoming Disney Plus movie? Or is it referring to an actual leak that happened to the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea lagoon at the Magic Kingdom? One can't be too sure. Or perhaps it's even a reference to the hidden Nautilus in the tree outside of Winnie the Pooh. Either way, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea may be coming back in some form sometime in the future, and that may or may not be the actual leak. You're welcome. Eskner's Keep. Now, this is a typo referring to Escher's Keep, which is a fictional location inside of Cinderella Castle in Orlando referred to in the Kingdom Keepers novels. It's a sort of walk-through M.C. Escher-style chamber, 
that would spit you back out into the castle moat if you took a wrong turn. Although that does sound like a really fun walkthrough attraction. Not only do you get to see some cool special effects inside the castle, but you also get to go for a swim if you do anything wrong. Lost Epcot Pavilions. Okay, now this is something I am very, very passionate about. When Epcot opened in 1982, Disney had set aside areas for more pavilions to be opened throughout the years than just the ones that were there on opening day. There are 11 pavilions there today, Canada, UK, France, Japan, the American Adventure, Italy, Germany, China, and Mexico, and absent on opening day were Morocco and Norway. Where the Millennium Village or Weird Festival Center is located today was going to be another pavilion. Equatorial Africa was going to go where that weird mini Africa pavilion is in between China and Germany. And there were plans for other pavilions like Russia and Israel, but they were cancelled. Most likely due to the political connotations those two countries carried back then and uh, honestly to this day. Not to mention there were a few cancelled rides for pavilions that did end up being built, like the Rhine River Cruise, the Thames River Cruise, Something tells me people in Disney like cruising down rivers. There was going to be a Spain pavilion, Fuji coaster, a Matterhorn clone. <sighs> what could have been? Atlantis Expedition. Now, before Finding Nemo Submarine Voyage opened at Disneyland, there was an idea to turn it into an Atlantis-themed ride. The plan got so far ahead into production that Disney even put up a sign above the loading area that said Atlantis Expedition Imagineering Preparation Base. Everyone could see it when you just walked past the lagoon. Now, this was before Atlantis was released into theaters, and when it was and underperformed, they went instead with Finding Nemo years later. So to all those Atlantis fans out there, sorry, you almost had an attraction. Almost. Epcot phone number. No, this is not the customer support number for the second best Disney theme park of all time. This is a phone number you could use to call the phone booths in the UK pavilion in the World Showcase. This is real. Now, why do I say could? Well, that's because you can't really do it anymore. The numbers have been disconnected or Disney turned them off. One of the two. Welcome to Verizon Wireless. Your call cannot be completed as the cult party is temporarily unavailable. Please try again later. Welcome to Verizon Wireless. Your call cannot be completed as the cult party is temporarily unavailable. Please try again later. Well, that was rude. But either way, you used to be able to call these phones from anywhere in the world and just have a chat with whoever was posing by it or inside of it at the time. Ask them how their day at Epcot's going, ask them if they're excited for Remy's Ratatouille Adventure opening October 1st, or ask them if they managed to get a reservation for Space 220. All of these things, except for the first one, they wouldn't have possibly known about back in the times it was open. As for calling from the phone booths, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't think you can, but I will check in with you guys next week. Go to my Twitter, at OffhandDisney, if you're interested to see me inside the phone booth trying to place a call. Disney Secret Service. Now, this is almost common knowledge. I would say this just belongs a couple tiers up, maybe not the second to last tier, but I mean, if you know, you know. Disney security will sometimes dress up as plain clothes guests and walk around the park looking like you and I, but actually on the prowl for any no good Ne'er do wells. Trying to climb the Mexico Pavilion Pyramid. Right to jail. Trying to spread ashes inside the haunted mansion. Right to jail. Right away. Any guest waiting in line next to you at the Mint Julep Bar or Mission Space could be a security cast member undercover. Just remember that next time you have the sudden urge to run backstage and check out the progress on the Play Pavilion. Seriously, what's going on back there? I need to know. And finally, the final tier, the last deepest, darkest point of the iceberg, we have Creepy Mickey from the 60s, or from probably the 50s. Ratatouille ride cancelled. Now, this one we can kind of just strike from the list, because this chart was made eight months ago, and back then there was a rumor going around that Ratatouille had been cancelled. Obviously, that never ended up happening, and Ratatouille is opening next week, as of the making of this video. Honestly, I, I can't tell you why this ever was a theory. I mean, the inside to the Ratatouille ride has allegedly been finished for about a year and a half to two years now. Or at least near completion. Especially eight months ago, that ride was done. I, I, I promise you the ride was finished inside. So strike, strike this one from the record. This one doesn't matter at all. The Ratatouille ride is not cancelled. Do not worry. It never will be. It's opening next week. It never was, it was just delayed. Now the Mary Poppins ride in the UK pavilion, that's a different story. We can replace, let's just go on here and done. Perfect. Honestly, I am a firm non-believer of the blank ride has been canceled due to COVID theories, but this one, 
This one might have been canceled. Disney Cemetery. Now, this one really isn't all that descriptive. It could be referring to the Imagineers' names on the tombstones outside of the Haunted Mansion. And, you know, I'm a sucker for the Haunted Mansion. The whole instance with the Spider-Man gravestone that happened a couple years ago, that was just a long story. The secret pet cemetery outside the Haunted Mansion in Anaheim, or Mr. Toad in the pet cemetery outside the mansion in Orlando. Or it could be referring to the Forest Lawn Cemetery, which is where Walt Disney's ashes are interred, along with his wife Lillian and their daughter Sharon. Or maybe Maybe there's a wacky, fun Disney-themed cemetery somewhere in the nation and I'm completely missing here. Take your pick, it could be one or all of these that I mentioned. Michael Eisner Blackmail. Now this has a whole bunch of backstory, so we'll start with MGM Studios. During the construction of MGM Studios, now known as Hollywood Studios in Orlando, Disney was planning on building another sort of semi-theme park in Burbank. This would be a retail and dining area mixed with a couple theme park attractions and themed areas. Think like Disney Springs with one or two rides. And if you're saying to yourself, well that sounds very close and very similar to Universal Studios, you would be correct. MCA, the company that at the time owned Universal Studios, alleged that, quote, Disney had privately offered earlier this year to withdraw from the Burbank plan if MCA would give up on its proposed Florida Studios tour. Essentially, if you don't build the backlot tour at Universal Studios in Florida, we won't build our MGM Studios in Burbank. Michael Eisner and Jeffrey Katzenberg denied these allegations, saying that, you know, this was completely made up and Disney hadn't said anything of the sort. At the end of the day, though, it seems that Universal got their way because they did end up building the backlot tour in Orlando. Orlando, and also the Burbank MGM Studios was cancelled because on top of the alleged blackmail that Disney had pulled with MCA, they also tried to get the city of Burbank to foot the bill. They wanted cheaper land for the new area and they wanted the city to build a brand new parking structure. Burbank said, uh, no. And so the project was cancelled. But now we have California Adventure, so I mean, uh, not the darkest timeline. Pete Mascot. Now, I really hate when they call these characters mascots. They're just called characters. Just a personal thing, though. But there used to be a Peg Leg Pete walk-around character you could meet at the parks. He is exceedingly rare, but I don't know why this one specifically is on the bottom tier. There are other extremely rare characters. But, I mean, you look at him, he is you know, kind of terrifying. So, okay, all right, this, this is fine. This belongs here. Walt's Final Ride. Now, there is a lot of debate as to what attraction Walt worked on last before he died. You could say Pirates of the Caribbean or the Haunted Mansion because New Orleans Square was the last land that opened before Walt passed, or you could say some things in New Tomorrowland. It opened after he was died, but it still carried a lot of the visionary ideals that Walt himself had, like the People Mover. Bring back the People Mover. Why aren't we talking about the People Mover? And I personally think he had to have helped out with attractions like Adventure Through Inner Space. The very last ride he had been on and actually ridden, I'm going to say, was Pirates of the Caribbean. Maybe not a full finished version of the ride, but he definitely helped test it out. And as we arrive here at the end of the iceberg, we come face to face with wishes make a wish. Now this is false. It's a myth. It's not real. Let me just temper your expectations before we get into it here. But the myth goes like this, is that a little girl loved Disney so much, and she was a Make-A-Wish child because she was terminally ill, her wish was to be a part of a Disney nighttime spectacular, or a Disney show in general. So before she tragically passed away, she got to record one line for the brand new Wishes fireworks show coming to the Magic Kingdom. And the little girl you hear singing at the very beginning of the show that was the Make-A-Wish child. And I've seen people say that that was the reason they were really heartbroken that Wishes was going away. That this little girl's final Make-A-Wish request was thrown by the wayside in order to bring about a new, and better, fireworks show happily ever after. But, uh, sorry to break it to you folks, this isn't real. This is a completely made up story, it never happened. The opening line was sung by none other than a person named Charity Ferris, who is very, much alive. Not a Make-A-Wish kid, just a singer that Disney hired and paid to sing the opening line. So you're gonna have to find another reason why your sad wishes went away. Any other reason would probably be justified though. Wishes going away is fine. It opened in 2003 and ran all the way to 2017. Happily Ever After going away, on the other hand, is a crime. It opened in 2017 and its last show is next week, as of the recording of this video. And heck, half a year of its technical run time didn't even happen because the parks were closed. Happily Ever After needs to come back in some form after Enchantment goes away from the 50th. Although, to be completely honest, Enchantment also looks amazing. So at least there's that. Patrick Begora woke up one bright morning feeling very fu- Oh, hi! What the- 
The iceberg? The Arctic? No, no, I'm having a little staycation reading to my friend here. Why would I go? Why I was getting frostbite? Everybody, does that make any sense? Why would I stay there? No, nope. I'm warm, and I'm reading up about the little man of Disneyland with my friend here. So, um, while you guys go investigating further icebergs, I'm going to stay here where it's warm and read about how Mickey and Donald displaced a small man from his home, okay? It's all the same to you. Go on. Shoot. I got better stuff I need to do. Yeah, I just wrote, noticed um, there's a roller coaster in the background of this picture of Main Street USA. Why was that? Why is that there? You see the castle right there is Main Street. Why is there a roller coaster back there? That's not the Matterhorn. Disneyland doesn't have a roller coaster like that. That's a plot hole. Before I release you all back into the world of the living, I must thank the sponsor for today's episode, the ones who made this one very long, the ones who made all of this possible. If you watch this channel, you know them and you love them. It's the Magic Candle Company. The Magic Candle Company is an oft-sided sponsor of this channel, and you should know who they are if you watch enough. If you don't, well, they offer bath products, candles, and hand sanitizers, all sorts of oils and whatnot that are made to smell like your favorite Disney attractions and buildings. If you head over to their website and use offer code OFFHAND15, you get 15% off your entire purchase. No matter what you buy, when you buy it, you get 15% off everything. So if you like to wash your hands like me, or maybe you're a bath person, or maybe you're just a candle person, maybe that's why you go to the magiccandlecompany.com and use offer code OFFHAND15, it's because you like candles. So go visit them, what are you waiting for? Use offer code OFFHAND15, help out the channel, and get some amazing smelling candles or sprays or bath bombs or really any oils you want on me. I mean, I give you the discount, you still have to pay for it. And a massive thank you to the Magic Candle Company for sponsoring this video. Hello, everybody, and thank you all so much for watching the Disney Parks Iceberg Explained. Now, if you enjoyed this video, it took a very long time for me to edit and put together, as you can clearly tell. So please, 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 and I'm serious this time, please leave a like and recommend this video to your friends. Share it with everybody. Subscribe if you're new around here. Believe me, it does go a long way, and I'll be very, very thankful. This took, like I said... So much, so much work. If you would feel so inclined, head over to patreon.com slash offhanddisney and even just one dollar gets you access to most of the perks. This video was not featured on Patreon because it took me so long to create, but don't worry, other videos will be, most of my other videos will be. Sorry, that was really loud. Please be sure to follow me on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter at offhanddisney. I post to some of them or all of them intermittently or all the time and anywhere in between. And once again, may I just say thank you all so much for sitting with me through this entire video. And if you watched the whole thing, we gotta have like a secret code word so I know who to uh, pay super close attention to, give all my likes and love and all my attention towards. So if you've watched this entire video from start to finish, okay, so... Uh, use code word Lafitte. All right, that's all you got to do. Like, I mean, it's a very common word on this channel, but that's all you have to do. Code word Lafitte, Lafitte, and sandals again in the same comment. Do that. That'll that'll make that'll be that'll be foolproof. Thank you all so much for watching this video, Lafitte sandals. Remember, and I will see you all in the next one. Goodbye.